What is up, heroes? This is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Zero Escape Virtue's Last Reward Blind. In the last episode, we had a puzzle, and I believe we escaped from the director's office. And now we're figuring out whatever the aftermath of such a situation is. And I don't really know, but Temioji seems pretty distressed. No, darn it! What's wrong? I left something in the director's office. Oh, that's not good. What was it? The picture. Uh, how could I forget it? Oh yeah, we must have set it down after using the face recognition thing. Yeah. I'm going back. You two go on ahead to the warehouse. I want to come with you. Me too. No, that's fine. Why don't you head back to the warehouse, Sigma? The others are probably already waiting. Hmm, that's kind of suspicious to me. Alright. I'll see you two later, then. Right. Bye, Sigma. I watched them jog off toward the blue door. And then they were gone. Guess I should be getting back then. Alright, so I guess we will return then. I wonder what Temyoji's up to in the director's office. I'm trying to recall how we saw it in that other timeline, see if it might be a little bit different. The differences in the appearance at the end of the puzzle versus when we ran into it in the other timeline. I can't recall anything striking. Although the computer didn't turn on before, right? When we were just trying to solve the room. That's probably the biggest difference, is the, the computer wouldn't even power on, but in that other timeline it was already on. Meaning it had likely been accessed, and somebody had to have figured out how to turn it on. I stepped into the warehouse to find all the other teams already there. Kay and Luna. Fine and Clover. And Dio. The moment Dio spotted me, he dashed over to the rightmost AB room and slid his card through the reader. <laughs> Gosh darn it, Dio! Why you gotta be like that? As he turned to look at me, I swore I saw a flash of a smug grin. Yeah, that's totally fitting. There. Happy? Yeah, I figured it was like uh, the rest of the team tried to get him to wait for everybody else to show up. This time I waited for you to get back before I opened it. You see, I can be considerate. But Temyoji and Quark aren't here. Yeah, where are they? I guess they forgot something back in the room we found. They ran back to grab it real quick. Then they'll be here in a few minutes. No big deal. Hmm. While we waited, we exchanged information about the rooms we'd investigated. Unfortunately, none of it seemed very useful. None of us had found anything. And we were no closer to unraveling any of the increasing number of mysteries we were faced with. With that discussion exhausted, we sat down to wait. Before long, 20 minutes had passed since Dio opened the door, and Temyoji and Quark were nowhere in sight. Yeah, this is taking a little bit longer than I would have expected. Don't you think they're taking a little too long? Yes, I'm getting worried. What if something happened to them? I'll go have a look. Then I shall accompany you. Nah, I'll be fine by myself. It's not that far away. Just don't look into the abyss too long, or you might become a monster. That's... I don't think... Uh, okay. <laughs> look, I'm just going to the director's office. I'll be right back. No big deal. Right, see you guys later. No big deal, just gonna go and find both of them dead, murdered at the hands of some tenth person or something like that. I gave a quick goodbye wave and stepped out of the warehouse.
Hmm. I would bet more on them just not being in the director's office altogether, and us finding the remains or, or evidence that some altercation occurred or some sort of event happened, and now they're off in some other location trying to fight for their lives or proceed with whatever next step in, I guess, in their intended plan is. But I don't think we're going to find them here. This music is unsettling, though. Huh? That's odd. There's nobody here. The picture's gone, though. Temyo Jin Quark must have been here, then. I laid out the floor B map. Hmm. They must have taken the door that faces the warehouse. After that, they probably went through the warehouse and out the blue door to the elevator. Yeah, that's a much shorter route. On the other hand, I came through the red door. Which is kind of the long way around. Hmm. Looks like we managed to miss each other perfectly. Ugh. Well, this was a huge waste of time. Shoot. Might as well head back, I suppose. Are they, like, locked in one of the closets or in that trap door area, maybe? I packed up the map and was headed toward the door when... Huh? There was a light on where there hadn't been a light before. What? Oh. Why is that thing on? We messed with it earlier, but nothing seemed to work. Or Temyoji knowingly chose not to use it. Or pretended to not know how to use it. I felt a sudden wave of inexplicable, nauseating dread. The light stared at me. I swallowed and edged cautiously toward it. The machine was in arm's reach now. I stretched my hand out toward it, slowly, slowly, and then... Teleport. Is that Snake? So, you finally made it. Who are you? That reminds me of Snake from 999. No, you're... I am Zero. What? We're meeting Zero? I was the one who brought you here. What? I did not expect to meet Zero face to face. You undoubtedly have as many questions for me as there are stars in the sky. His voice is familiar. As you can see, however, this is only a recording. I will therefore be unable to directly answer any questions. Ask if you wish, but I cannot respond. Ugh. I considered taking a swing at him, but decided that was spectacularly futile and kept my bald fist to my side. Now, where to begin? Ooh, is... What's he going to tell us? There are many things I wish to tell you. So, obviously I'm not going to stop and interrupt every bit of this conversation, but it's interesting that Zero is wanting to tell us so much, and my initial question is why wait up until this point? The way Zero is presenting, oh, I have a lot of things I want to tell you and you finally made it to this point, is kind of giving the impression that Zero's initial intentions were suppressed, were hijacked by something else, and this game that was created in one sense was perverted into something else, right? That is now the game we're experiencing as it is. But unfortunately, our time is limited. As such, the information I can provide is also limited. I have chosen two things of great importance to tell you. First, I will tell you about termites. Hmm. In retrospect, I suppose that's a rather odd thing to say. I imagine you look rather bewildered right now. Perfectly understandable. The person who kidnapped you and threatened you with death is lecturing you about insects. I suspect it hardly seems fair. What's interesting is, 
he just essentially admitted to the, the kidnappings and threatening with death, so that's part of the intentional setup of the Nonary game. If I had to guess, the termite analogy is going to go with regards to some sort of like hive mind, or maybe a collective action, or, or trailing via pheromones, something invisible, yet influences each other's decisions sort of thing. Nonetheless, this is very important. In a way, it will determine your fate. So I ask that you listen carefully. Have you ever seen a termite mount? They are splendid structures. Some might even call them works of art. Termites are natural architects, and their mounds are both structurally sound and make excellent use of space. So are they following some sort of plan as they build? Are there termite blueprints detailing which room goes where? No, of course not. Each termite is simply an oblivious cog in a tremendous machine programmed by millions of years of termite DNA. It is doubtful an individual termite has, or termite has any idea what its contributions are helping uh, to create. But a human does. We can appreciate the elegant forms of their alien cathedrals. We can see the simple beauty of their perfect functionality. We can understand the splendid planning of their structure. In other words, only an intelligence of a higher order can understand the beauty of what the termite builds. Now, consider humans. Why are we alive? Why do we love and give birth? Why do we create? From where do our cultures spring? There are many theories, but no one knows the truth. We are oblivious cogs in a tremendous machine programmed by millions of years of human DNA. No doubt you see now what this analogy is supposed to illustrate. Yes, I mean to say humans are not different from termites. We trudge through our lives with no greater understanding of our ultimate goal. You might say we don't understand what we're building. Only an intelligence of a higher order than ours can understand what we're doing. Imagine how we might look to such an intelligence. Yeah, that is an interesting analogy. I had never really considered this point before, but that is really neat. We may be building some structure so perfect and elegant we can't even perceive it. Whatever it is, we've likely been building it on a dimension just above the ones we know since time immemorial. If we are like the termites, then what we've created is almost certainly something of tremendous beauty. And you are about to catch a glimpse of it. Or have you already? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure he's referring to the morphogenetic field slash whatever we're tapping into to, you know, glimpse between timelines. Well, that's enough on that subject, I think. Consider what I've said.
Now, let's move on to the second topic. It is somewhat more immediately meaningful to your life, and in fact, the lives of several billion other people. Also, before we get into this, <laughs> I just want to comment, are his pants like one big zipper around the side? It's, it feels like if you move those circles to the side, his whole just like his upper torso and his lower half will just come undone, like unzip completely. I realize this is rather sudden, but I have a password for you. Okay, is this going to be the password to the computer? If so, that's pretty important. And I'm wondering why... I guess something I'm, I'm still curious about is, why is this hologram something that didn't activate when we were in the room earlier? And if so, who activated it? Likely Tamioji slash Quark, right? Um, and why was it placed in this room? Why is this information locked behind this machine, which presumably only one or two people maybe know how to use, right? Is the information directed for them, or is it really intended for everybody, but up to the decision of the individuals that have the ability to actually access it to share it, right? I don't know. Um, I'd imagine, like everything in the Nonary game, something is designed with a very specific in intent behind it. But... Yeah, just, just thinking about that. It is the password to disarm the bomb number one. Oh, the bomb? Are you ready? I will only say this once, so pay close attention. The password to disarm the number one bomb is... So... A lot of things to digest here, right? We're obviously going to pick up this password here. My question is, we are always wondering who placed the bombs. And I'm fairly confident Dio admitted to placing the zero bomb, which we haven't found yet. And I think the impression was, oh, Dio was also responsible for the other bombs. But maybe he wasn't. The fact that Zero knows there is a bomb, that there are multiple bombs and they're numbered individually and require passwords, makes me think that Zero had planted those bombs in the first place in order to instill distrust amongst the participants in the Nonary game, right? That in and of itself is incredibly useful information. Okay, BQZ, RGJ, DXR. And with that, we have the number zero and the number one bomb passwords. I had no idea what he was talking about. What bomb? Was he saying there were bombs, too? If he'd guessed at my future confusion, he showed no sign of it. That is the last of the information this message was meant to convey. Before I go, however, I have a warning. You cannot tell any of your companions what you heard or saw here. Why not? If you do, you will be penalized. Immediately. I hope we will meet again someday. Interesting. So you can't tell the others about the, the termite analogy, which is not as imperative, but the idea of there being a bomb nobody else is aware of is probably pretty distressing to Sigma at the moment. I wonder what the penalty would be. How is that programmed in advance, right? Presumably, maybe even Zero has been able to tap into the morphogenetic field and perceive other timelines, future decisions, etc. And that's part of why Zero can so accurately program the Notary Games events, right? <laughs> We would have much to discuss. Wait. Darn it, you can't just spout all that crap and disappear. I found myself yelling at empty air. The hologram had disappeared. What kind of an idiot does he take me for? Termites? Other dimensions? How could that have anything to do with kidnapping us? 
Also, I will say, this is an incredibly appropriate use of the word dimension, and I applaud the game for uh, for using it in such a manner. Those of you that have seen multiple of my Let's Plays, especially those involving Corpse Party, know that dimension being used for something like parallel universe or other world or other timeline is something I get pretty nitpicky about, even though it's not super consequential. Um, but this is this is perfect use of dimension. Crap. I kicked out a nearby shelf. And, of course... Ten minutes remain until Ambidex game polling closes, and we still don't know where Temyoji and Quark are. Right? Alright, basically telling us to vote. Aw, oh, crap. I need to get back. Not like there's any point staying here. I mean, we've been working under the assumption that Temyoji and Quark have made their way back, but we just missed them, but that might not be the case. I spun around and ran out of the room toward the warehouse. Grandpa! Look, Sigma's back! Hmm. Hmm. Took you long enough. So it took us 10 in-game minutes to experience that hologram, which means it took... I mean, that would still not explain Quark and Temyoji's absence for 20 minutes, right? Where are the others? In the AB rooms. They went in already? Yep. Why didn't you two? Have you been waiting for me? Yeah. Grandpa said there was something he had to tell you before we voted, no matter what. Oh? Nothing that significant. Just want to tell you that we're going to choose Ally this round. That's it. And you had to tell me that no matter what? I mean, yeah, it's it's important. It influences your decision, right? It's you're, You certainly would think it's more likely that they're going to choose Ally now than if you hadn't heard that, right? Seems kind of pointless. I mean, words are cheap. You can promise whatever you want. True, but we've got something to back it up. Just hear me out. Okay, go ahead. Quark and I both have 8 BP. We're already on the home stretch. So, what do we need to get to the magic number? Well, we need you to choose Ally. If you do that, it doesn't really matter to us what we pick. You'd get to 9 whether you got 2 or 3 points. Exactly. However, choosing Betray protects you against a likely Betray from Sigma in this situation, right? If, if you anticipate that Sigma doesn't want you to get to 9 points and is going to pick Betray at a very high probability, then, then Betray is, protects you and your potential point totals. However, well, I mean, even if you do get Betrayed after choosing Ally in this situation and you drop to 6 points, on the next round you could still make it to 9 with a Betrayal of your own, right? That being the case, we don't have any reason to betray you. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that statement. You could potentially choose to betray in hopes of protecting yourself against a likely betrayal. But if you choose betray here, the likelihood that anybody allies with you again is going to be pretty low. And if we both choose ally, we both gain points. True, but you must have considered that I'll choose Betray. That would mean you'd choose Betray to protect yourselves. But that's why we're telling you we won't choose Betray. Mm-hmm. Can I trust you? Of course. I mean, if you want to earn my trust, don't tell me you're going to choose Ally. Tell me you're not going to leave us all behind once you get above 9 points. That's really what I care about in this situation. Alright, tell me one thing. Well, let's say we do this in both ally. Everybody gets two points. That means you and Quark will have enough to leave. Which is great for you, but I'll be stuck with a measly five. 
How do I know you aren't going to just open the number 9 door and leave us in the lurch? I can guarantee it. How? I can give you my word. <laughs> I mean, I will say, in general, Temyoji's word is pretty meaningful across the different timelines, right? He generally is a person who, you know, who goes by his word, but at the same time, that's a pretty weak promise. I will not open the number 9 door, even if I have enough points to do so. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. We Actually, I, despite his word being very meaningful, we've seen in that other timelines, he was willing to sacrifice himself to get Quark out. If he has the perfect setup, meaning both him and Quark are able to escape, I don't know if he could turn that down, right? If in other timelines he was willing to sacrifice himself to get Quark out, now he can get Quark out with himself to look after him, to live with him, etc. I, I don't know, man. I swear it. We aren't going to abandon everybody else, so just so we can escape. I swear too. I promise. Man. So all you've got is a promise, huh? When I make a promise, I keep it. Trust me. Please. You've got to trust us. Ah, that's a tough sell. Alright, fine. I'll trust you. Uh, what are, what are we going to pick, guys? What are we going to pick? Two minutes remain until Ambidex game polling closes. We're counting on you, Sigma. You gotta choose Ally. The thing is, like, even... One of the things that's been so nice about the earlier AB games is that people are accountable for their decisions. They can choose to, to screw somebody over, but it's gonna impact them in future rounds. That doesn't apply in this case, right? Because there might not be another AB game. You promised. With that, they turned and ran into the AB room, second from the right. Well, guess I should get moving. Are we gonna choose ally or betray, guys? I don't know. I don't know. The thing is, if we choose betray, we also only have to play two more AB games in order to get to nine, whereas if we choose Ally, we have a minimum of three games in order to play um, and reach nine points, which is just not super promising. So I don't know, guys. I really don't. One minute remains. I had a decision to make. Should I trust Quark and Temyoji? Well, I could believe they were telling the truth and still betray them. That would bring my BP to 6. I'd be that much closer to 9. And choosing Betray would guarantee that they wouldn't try and escape without the rest of us. Betrayal seemed like the safe bet, and it is. But... Please. You've got to trust us. You've got to choose Ally. You promised. Temyoji, I could betray easily enough, but Quark? What the heck was I going to do? Of course. Ten seconds remain. Nine, eight, seven... Six, five, ah, I don't know, guys. I don't know. We're gonna choose Ally. We're gonna choose Ally. And hope that Temyoji and Quark stand by their word in this timeline. We've seen time and time again that in different timelines, people change their behaviors, right? And so one timeline where Temyoji is willing to sacrifice himself to get Quark out is not... I, I can't reliably base Temyoji's actions in this timeline on those actions. And that doubt 
that uncertainty is enough for me to say, well, I guess I will go on his word then, because I don't have a lot to go on otherwise. And it's probably just me being a naive optimist. So the results will be displayed. Thank you for your participation. Wow, going right up to the screen. Results from round three of the Ambidex game will now be displayed. All right, so we're going to check out these results in just a second. It's a little bit too early to end the episode here, so, <laughs> so we'll check them out now. <laughs> Did I get you guys? Uh, that was a pretty fun one. <laughs> it's been so long since we've seen so many faces participate. All right, so Alice, Fi, and Dio, they both choose to betray each other. Wow. Oh, oh, shoot. Oh no! Oh no, it's the feels bad ending. It's the big time feels bad ending. <laughs> Temyoji and Quark. Wow. Wow. Okay, so let's let's take a look. Alice and Fi and Dio. Yeah, they both chose Betray. Makes 110% sense, right? Playing up against Dio as a solo when he has the chance to get to number 9. Yeah, that's an easy Betray. Especially coming from Alice and Fi, who tend to lean towards Betrayal anyways. Luna and Clover. Interestingly, choose Betray. What was the dynamic there, right? So K chose to ally. K and Clover could have made it out if they both chose ally. Clover wasn't willing to let K out, potentially. Interesting that they chose Betray. I, I can't help but imagine what Luna's role was in that, right? And hopefully Clover didn't forcefully assert herself in that sense, either. Huh. Huh. Yeah, I'm really curious. Luna was in a kind of screwy situation either way. The only way that Luna makes it out of there without anybody reaching more than nine is if they both choose to betray. So I guess in that sense, Luna would have incentive to choose betray, to try to push Clover to choose betray. I'm shocked Kay chose ally, though. Actually, well, I don't know what their conversation was beforehand. That's tough. But Tenyoji and Quark, of course, the gut punch, right, uh, from the game. Telling us, yeah, you can't trust anyone. Yep, their word, yada, yada, yada. Anyways, now Clover, Temyoji, and Quark are going to leave us behind. The fact that they chose Betray tells us all we need to know about how this is going to play out. <laughs> so screw you, Temyoji. Screw you, Quark. Brought you back from the dead. Hey! What the heck, guys? Why'd you betray me? Quark had nothing to do with this. I made the vote. Grandpa. Alright, fine. Why'd you break your promise, Temyoji? I only promised you one thing. We wouldn't open the number 9 door even if we got 9 points. What? So, you're not going to leave? Not what I said. Of course we're going to leave. Temyoji... I, I hate this. When it's like, okay, he's really picking his words. He's like, I only promised that we wouldn't open the number 9 door. But Quark is the person who promised to choose Ally. But Quark didn't have any say in this decision. It was all me. But I didn't promise you I would choose Ally. And of course, we're not going to open the number 9 door, but I anticipated somebody else, whether it be Clover or Kay, would have the ability to do so. So when they open the number 9 door, we're going to leave. But I kept my promises, ha ha ha. What? Look. See Clover over there? This is a setting where it's like, yeah, okay, Temyoji didn't lie technically, but it's not like telling the truth in this case is any more ethical than straight up lying, right? Like, it's not really changing the big picture of how, I guess, just kind of scummy this was, but what? Arguably, it makes it even worse that it's like deceptively truthful. Don't tell me. Wow. And there she goes. Oh no. She's... That Baka. 
Wait, Quark and Temyoji have... The words were barely out of her mouth when Temyoji and Quark ran past. No, gosh darn it. Clover. Are you really going to leave? Well, yeah. Why else would I open the door? But why? I'm going to go call the others. So we can capture Zero Senior. Temyoji, are you and Quark going too? Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry, everybody. So, Sigma. Happy? I kept my promise. Clover opened the door, not me. Yeah, I, I'll be honest, this ending is probably one of the most frustrating. <laughs> Just because this sort of thing really bugs me, uh, really ticks me off. Like, I, I, I like the English language and I try to be pretty particular about what words I use and intentional about the meanings behind them, but I hate when people do this to kind of snake their way around deceptively hiding their intentions um, under a facade of, oh, I'm telling the truth, I'm keeping my promises, some like farce of morality and like upholding ethics while being incredibly devious and yeah, just not, I guess not, not morally sound, but like heck, I'm happy. That's some shady crap, Temyoji. If you say so. I have to get out of here, and that's that. He's gotta pay for what he's done. I hope, <laughs> for, for the sake of anybody who ends up in a nonary game with me, if I ever end up one in my future, Playing VLR is uh, is gonna make me so jaded in such an experience. Normally, you guys are seeing, if I were to play through one of those games in IRL, I'd be so much more naively optimistic and get taken advantage of. But now, no, 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 no. VLR has hardened me. He. Zero. You mean you know who Zero Senior is? Yeah. No point keeping it a secret now, I suppose. What? Oh, so Temyoji is going to lay it all out then. He knows who Zero is. I know exactly who Zero Senior is. What? Yeah, they must have worked together or something. The number nine door has been opened. This also confirms that Temyoji obviously saw the hologram, uh, was able to interact with it, probably knew about it, and was deceptive while we were in the room about not knowing how to start it, etc., but came back for it afterwards. Arguably even intentionally left that photo behind to give him an excuse to go get it. Let's go. Come on, guys. Time to move. Right. Come on, K, stop them! I say this in like every ending. K could totally stop everybody, but doesn't. Oh, wait! This is for you, Sigma. Quark held something out. I looked down to see two pieces of folded paper. What is this? It's a letter. I wrote it in the director's office before the AB game. What? Why? What information does it hold, and why are you giving it to me like this? I wanted to tell you what kind of guy Grandpa is. Oh. So, read it, okay? He pressed it into my hand. See you later, Sigma. Then he turned and ran toward the door, Temyoji and Clover following in his footsteps. I was so surprised by the letter that I didn't even try to stop them. Before I could think of anything to say, See you. Goodbye. And there you have it, guys. Q. 
The number nine door is closed. No nerd game's over. Thanks. Have fun with the remainder of your life. <laughs> So, how about that letter? Crap. They're gone. All we can do now is hope they bring help back. Indeed. I agree. I looked down at Quark's letter and slowly unfolded it. His handwriting was still slightly uneven. But he'd filled both pages with writing. I began to read. Oh boy, this music, the art changed and everything. It was a really stormy day when he found me. He said the rain was coming down so hard it almost hurt, but somehow he managed to hear a baby crying. I guess I must have been crying pretty loud. He took me home and did his best to raise me, but he'd never been married or had a kid before, so I think it was really hard for him. He couldn't figure out how to mix the formula, so he was always carrying the directions around with him. Also, I guess I was a pretty picky eater, so if he didn't get the water to formula ratio just right, I wouldn't eat it. I guess that was kind of a pain, huh? But he didn't give up, and now here I am. When he found me, I was really, really small, and he was worried that I might not make it. And that's why he named me Quark. Aw, that's cute. A Quark is a really, really small thing, and I was really, really small too. Grandpa didn't need to worry, though, because it turned out that I was pretty tough. When I was one, he forgot I was sleeping in the bed of his truck and drove off. I rolled out and went off the back, but I didn't even get scratched. <laughs> Are you for real right now? I started walking when I was two, and when he wasn't looking, I fell down the stairs. I didn't get hurt then either. When I was three, I got really sick. I had a super high fever for a week, but eventually I got better. I guess you could say I'm pretty lucky. Anyway, I didn't really have any more accidents after that, and I was a pretty healthy kid. By the time I was six, I'd started helping Grandpa out with his work. His job was to gather junk from abandoned buildings. Then he'd fix it up, or pull out the useful parts and sell them. There were plenty of abandoned buildings, but finding good stuff in them was hard. You had to know which parts were useful, or you could end up wasting a bunch of time. Every time I'd find something, he'd explain to me what it was, how it was supposed to work, how to fix it, all sorts of things. Usually, though, I just wanted to finish up work so I could go to the theater. The theater came to our town once a week in a wagon. They'd show old news or movies. The theater, huh? I went every single week, but Grandpa only went once in a while, and he'd only go weeks when they showed movies. Oh yeah, I didn't know that I'd been adopted until I was seven. One of the other kids in my block told me. I guess after Grandpa found me, he looked all over town to try and find somebody who'd take me. Who'd take me. The kid from my block actually had a mom, and he'd asked her if she would take me, too. I gotta admit, I was pretty shocked when I heard that. There weren't a lot of kids with parents around, so hearing that someone lived with his actual mom was pretty impressive. Interesting. That's an incredibly interesting line, right? What does that tell you about the world that Quark grew up in, that Temyoji lived in, where most people didn't even have parents, period. Um, that's pretty sad. I was also kind of surprised that Grandpa had tried to get someone else to take me. Did that mean he didn't want me? The kid who told me about Grandpa trying to get rid of me was a real jerk. He was totally spoiled and he bragged to everybody about how he had a mom. He liked to come up to me while I was working and say stuff like, must be hard not having a mother. It never bothered me before, but after I found out that Grandpa had adopted me, I started to think that maybe he didn't really want me. Oh no, not Quirk, no! If I could work on my own, then he could get rid of me. I was scared to know the truth, so I never asked him. Then one day he took me to a bar in our neighborhood. During the day, of course. He went there sometimes to drink scotch, but I had never gone before. When we got in, he just walked up to the counter with that grumpy look he has, and I thought, oh no, he's gonna make me work here. But I was wrong. I saw him pass something to the bartender, and then he picked me up and set me down on a stool next to the counter. The stool was pretty high, especially for a seven-year-old kid, and my legs just dangled off of it. It seemed really, really high to me, and I was pretty nervous. Eventually, the bartender came back over with a glass of scotch and another big glass full of something else. 
As I looked closer, I realized that the second glass was full of some sort of brown liquid with a scoop of ice cream in it. It took me a minute to realize what it was. A root beer float. I'd never seen one before. I was so surprised. Root beer was even more expensive than the nicest alcohol in the bar. To me and the other kids, it seemed more like an urban legend than a real drink. But there it was, right in front of me. I stared at the float. I still wasn't sure it was real at that point, and then turned to look at Grandpa. He looked back at me. I didn't know what to do, so I turned to the bartender. He'd already turned around and moved off though, so I figured he must have put the glass down in front of me on purpose. It still didn't seem like it could be real, and I was just staring at it when Grandpa told me to hurry up and drink it before the ice cream melted. His gruff voice sounded like an angel's. Is this really mine? He nodded. Words can't describe how awesome it was. I never tasted anything like root beer before. The creamy sweetness of the ice cream made my entire head feel light. I felt like the luckiest boy in the whole world. That's not an exaggeration, I really thought that. The root beer float was delicious, but what made me even happier was Grandpa. When I looked over at him, he was smiling. I know that's gotta be hard for you to imagine, but he really was. I will say this, this phenomenon is something, is one of, I guess like the greatest things I've experienced and it's something that I will experience more eventually when I have a family of my own and so forth, but truly finding happiness from the happiness of somebody you care about deeply is so gratifying, right? When you care so much about someone that their happiness bringing, brings you your own happiness, that experience is something that's so difficult to put to words. And it's not something that I think you really experience until you find somebody that you care so deeply about and can kind of understand and appreciate how how fulfilling it is to to invest in their own happiness. It, it's so difficult to describe, but I feel like I wasn't able to really experience that until I was, you know, an adult even. Right then, I didn't care whether he just found me and adopted me or not. He bought me a root beer float. That made me way luckier than some kid who had a mother, but it never tasted root beer. <laughs> wow, what a world. Of course, after we left the bar, he was the first kid I bragged to. So Grandpa and I were doing pretty good. Until the fight. I was in a super bad mood that day. I had torn one of my shoes that morning, and some old drunk guy had yelled at me. All the junk I found was totally useless. The day was almost over, and I was fed up. So I just grabbed some random trash and took it back to the house. When I showed what I'd found to Grandpa, he frowned. He started going through each thing I'd brought back, explaining why they were all useless. I got really mad and just yelled, I don't care. Then he got mad, and I couldn't take it anymore, so I ran away. Oh no. I was pretty upset, and I started thinking that maybe Grandpa had only adopted me so he could raise me to work and make money for him. After a while, I went and hid in an abandoned building, but by then I would started to calm down and think that maybe I should go back and apologize. It had started raining pretty hard though, so I decided I should wait for it to stop. But that was just an excuse. The truth was that I was nervous. Part of me knew I'd done something wrong, but I didn't want to admit it. The rain didn't stop though, so I just sat there staring out at the gloomy gray sky. I imagined Grandpa coming to get me. It kept raining all night, and he never showed up. I gave up waiting and decided it was time to go home. I was about halfway there when I heard somebody groaning. At first I thought I should just ignore it and not get involved, but I went over anyway and it was Grandpa. He was totally soaked, and I could tell right away that he'd been there for a really long time. I yelled and he opened his eyes a little bit. He smiled weakly and said he was glad I was safe. He'd spent all night out in the rain, looking for me. I felt awful. Grandpa had been out in the rain looking for me so long that he'd collapsed. I was horrible. He'd heard me crying in the rain, but I hadn't heard him. As I ran to get the doctor, I promised whatever god might be listening that if they would only save Grandpa, I'd never ask for another root beer float ever again. He got a real bad fever and his temperature wouldn't go down for days. The doctor said that if it kept up, he'd die. If he died, then I'd be all alone. There wouldn't be anybody left to care about me. The thought of that happening terrified me. 
Fortunately, I must have passed some of my luck on to Grandpa, because a week later his fever finally broke. I was glad he wasn't going to die, but I was also a little scared. What if he had decided he didn't want a stupid kid like me around anymore? My plan was to apologize as soon as he woke up, but when the moment came, my brain just stopped. Grandpa started to talk, and it took me a minute to realize he was apologizing. I didn't know what to think. He explained that he was an old man, and that meant he was probably going to die sooner rather than later. He was strict with me because he wanted to make sure I'd be able to make it on my own after he was gone, but maybe he'd been a little too strict. Oh, that makes me so sad, guys. This is really touching. All the things I'd worried about had been stupid and selfish. Grandpa cared about me a whole lot. He'd been worried when I ran off, and he'd gone out in the rain to look for me. I tried to apologize, but when I opened my mouth, I just started crying. I don't think I've cried that much since I was a baby. But he just smiled and patted my head. I asked him if he'd ever regretted adopting me. His eyes got all wide and he said, of course not. He told me that he was looking for a really important lady. And because of that, he'd had to give up on pretty much everything else in his life. But when he took me in and started raising me, he felt like he'd gotten some of what he lost back. Interesting. That's probably Akane, right? That was when I decided I'd stay with him forever. Even if he said I couldn't. Oh! Oh man, the feels! What a touching story! What a touching story! And now they're, they're playing the OP? Yeah? But I don't see, like, an ending. I don't see anything yet. Oh! Oh, what?! Credits! Oh my, so this must have been, like, the, the Temyoji Quark ending. Wow! I thought this was, like, game over. I mean, and it kind of is, right? <laughs> it is technically, like, a, a bad end, per se. But, wow! Also, what a roller coaster! Going from being incredibly upset with Temyoji and Quark to... You know, all the feels with regards to their relationship and their background. I will say that hearing that background easily makes them some of my favorite characters at the moment. I mean, we still have yet to learn about so many of them, too. I'm very excited. Wow. Wow. So Temyojin Quark lived in this sort of post-apocalyptic world where most people didn't have parents. There was so much junk around and that that was the the large, you know, part of the economy. And Temyoji gave up everything to look for Akane. Why? How does Temyoji know Akane is part of why I'm so so curious. And it makes me wonder, is that old woman Akane from the future? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It has me really curious. And then, of course, we now know that Temyoji knows exactly who Quark is, or not who Quark, who Zero is, right? So we saw that visual, and he must have recognized him immediately. They must have worked together. It makes me think Temyoji might be... Like, how is Temyoji related to the original 999 game, is the real question. Is he the son of somebody who was in the original 999 game? Is he the parent of somebody? Like, is he related to somebody? Was he in the original 999 game? I don't know. Did he work at the same company as Ace or something like that? And that's how he knew? I don't know. What did Temyoji do before he started collecting junk? It was clearly related to, like, outer space, right? He recognized something related to that recording and the whole, like, Mars project. Hmm, so there's still a lot more to learn about Temyoji, but we definitely know a lot more about Temyoji and Quark now. I'm glad we finally got the chance to learn, and I'm glad we had so much time to spend with Quark, a character who's been absent in so many of the different endings, or timelines, but there's the, there's the Temyoji ending. I hope you guys enjoyed that one. I certainly did, but um, I'm going to say that 
we're gonna we're gonna call it there and in the next episode we're gonna take a look at the remainder of the flow chart and see what we find this was a long timeline holy cow um what's gonna happen we'll probably get some crazy bad end if we choose to betray there but maybe not maybe not i don't know um so we'll take a look at that in the next episode but wow uh we've also i was fairly confident we might unlo have unlocked something with that bomb knowledge but it doesn't look to be the case we still have the same things unlocked from before based on the journal so all right well um until the next episode when we explore the alternative timeline here and then i guess go back uh, we'll probably go back to this more proximal or th this branch here rather than continue on with this one. But I don't, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. But until the next episode, this has been Night Zero, and this mission is complete.